Um, having said all that, Dave, Neely, we're going to get Dave to come up and share with us. Let me just give a brief introduction to Dave. Dave's been in Wiley and Brisbane for 172 years, something along those lines. Might be a little bit shorter. You can stand up if you want. It's okay. Um, yeah, man, it's, good. it's good. So, so, Dave, so Dave's been a really, really great friend of ours for a long time. Um, we had some, um, some leaders together yesterday. Dave spent some time with us. That was really, really good. Um, but I just, again, love to honour people that have invested into this place. Uh, Dave has got me personally through a lot of challenges in my journey. Uh, I wouldn't be uh, preaching today if it wasn't for Dave. I had a bad experience at one point and had decided, and my wife can confirm, I was never going to pick up a microphone ever again. It wasn't a bad experience. It was very bad feedback on its experience. It was actually quite good. But uh, anyway, I decided it was all over and Dave knocks on my door one night and sits me down and basically spoke into my world. And it's because of that conversation that I decided that, okay, I'll exercise this gift again and get back on the horse. So I want to honour Dave for that. And also behind the scenes, there's been a lot of things that we've done throughout the life of Arise from our GSAC days to now, where Dave has spoken into us, given us wisdom. Uh, he's also been here on, on, on a few occasions. You've preached two or three times for us, had some time with our leaders. Uh, you've run the Strengths Finder program for our church, and, and we've had other churches in the area come together for that as well. So Dave is a bit of a jack of all trades and has had a lot of, uh, a lot of things to do with us in the past. So it's great to have you here this morning, Dave, to bring a word to encourage us and uh, uh, lay on us what's, what's on your heart, what you feel like God's got for us this morning, mate. So bless you. So much. And I'm so glad that I had the conversation with you, Alan, because I think we'd all agree that Alan has an incredible gift as a communicator and also as an incredible teacher. And so obviously it's a gift of the Lord and uh, that was a, a privilege and opportunity to be able to just get you back on track and to say that is your gift and calling. So we all enjoy when you communicate, Alan, and, and you're just so gifted at it. So that's so awesome. A number of you, I, want, I actually want to talk about a hope in the future. Is it up on the screen? Let's get it up on the screen. I want to talk about a hope in the future. And I'm sure that this has been a topic that you've talked about. Everybody's talked about hope uh, through the whole pandemic. But I just want to talk about it again because I feel like it's so important. I'm a bit of a metaphor man. I'm not great with words, but a picture is better than a million words, and uh, metaphors are what God uses mostly. So this is a metaphor I'm going to use to try to paint a picture of how awesome hope is. Um, I remember probably about 10 years ago, I was just not looking after myself like a, you know, a bit of a fool out in the heat of summer, and I got severely dehydrated. And to describe what I was, I was just like a floppy mess. It, it's like life had left me. I was a blob in the ground. I had no emotions, no feeling, no energy. I was just in a bad state. And so they took me to hospital expecting some major, exciting kind of, you know, dramatic thing. And it was dehydration, which is very embarrassing. Um, and so I'm a floppy mess on this just I am gone on this bed. They put this drip in my arm, and let me tell you, within five minutes, I was like ready to explode. I felt like there was a fire hydrogen in me. My energy was exploding. I felt like I could, I could jump through the roof. My emotions, I think I experienced emotions that I've never experienced before. I just felt alive, and I felt like I could do a million things at once. And I think if I was to describe hope, it's a little bit like that. Because the opposite of hope, when you don't have hope, it's a little bit like um, dehydration or, or maybe even hypothermia, where what happens is all that energy, all that momentum, all that flow of emotions and excitement and joy and light and the way that you see the world just withdraws and, and you pull back, you pull back from... Uh, your, your activities, you pull back from work, you pull back from friends, you pull back from family, and you retreat right into yourself, and you just go into a state of almost half death, half life. You're just trying to stay alive, but you're essentially dying when you don't have hope. It is life itself, and, and I thought about that stuff. I haven't done drugs. I think I took some magic mushies when I was about three up in Redcliffe, and apparently it was a pretty uh, wild experience. I can't remember it, but I haven't done drugs. But I tell you what, I think about that stuff they put in that saline solution and what it did to me, and I tell you what, that is the best metaphor I can possibly use for what hope does for you. Because when you get hope, it is like a fountain and your energy flows, your momentum flows, your, your excitement to help other people and enjoy relationships and to do stuff. 
everything is like in abundance and in excess, uh, and including emotions, which I'm not so good at, but all of a sudden, they just come from nowhere. And, and I, I just felt like hope is like that. And like I said, hopelessness is a little bit like dehydration or hypothermia, where everything shuts down and you recoil, you pull back, and you just, momentum stops, flow stops. And so I want to talk a little about hope because it is such a powerful substance. It is an incredibly powerful substance. And if you can get hold of it as an individual, it is so powerful. If you can keep it and then get a, at it as a community, it is an incredibly powerful substance. And so we talk about it in the Bible. Let's talk about it this morning. I, um, I was born in a, a beautiful little country town called Redcliffe. So my mum and dad were a brand new cu uh, couple, uh, pretty young. You know, they had babies young in those days. Um, I think my mum was 18, dad was 20, something like that. They had uh, two kids straight away, the two of us, my oldest sister and myself. They're living in this beautiful little fishing village called Redcliffe. There's a bit of a mean joke that they have in Brisbane, that if you go across the Horny Brook Highway, 30 minutes to Redcliffe, you go back in time 20 years. And it's kind of still a bit like that. They're catching up a little bit, but it's just a beautiful little uh, simple fishing village. My father lived there as Germans for a long, long time. And they had a hope and a future for their family. Unfortunately, circumstances around them, we all have circumstances. Everybody, every generation, every individual has circumstances. Circumstances are real things. They're not necessarily good or bad. They're data. You have to make decisions. For them to take that hope and see it transitioned into the reality of a future, they needed to pass through the threshold or the doorway of circumstances. They needed to translate their hope that they had through the circumstances of the time, make decisions to walk into that future and make that hope come into their reality. So they, unfortunately, made the decision to go to Melbourne. Uh, and so they moved and they were deeply intimidated uh, going from this really simple culture to this huge beast of a thing called Melbourne. Um, and it was overwhelming in many ways, but it was a great decision for them. Uh, there was great opportunities, particularly for my father's skills and his career path, and in so many different ways. Uh, I don't think I would have found the Lord if I was back with my family in Redcliffe. Uh, and so you can see in hindsight, it was a great hope and a future decision that they made through those circumstances. You know, um, it's a little bit like that, isn't it? We have this hope of expectation and ex excitement and energy that we want to invest, but we have to analyse the circumstances of our time to translate and bring that into the natural. Now, I was only really young, uh, a little boy in the 60s uh, in Melbourne, and Melbourne is an amazing city, really. Uh, it's got its problems and, you know, we can bag it, you know, I know you do. Uh, but... A Melbourne is, is quite rich in a culture, and you can't deny that there is an incredible current. It is like a whirlpool of current. It is a personality. It's, got, it's like a force. And uh, it's also an amazing place because it's a, an incredible picture of a culture that has multiple cultures thriving within it. And so um, not only we, we moved into a suburb called Doncaster, which was a, a new area that was literally orchards that was being carved up into brand new developments. And it was a perfect location where migrants from all over the world were pouring in. And so every single family that moved in, and they were from all over the world. I would walk down the street and there's the Egyptian family. They'd painted silver. Um, I'm not sure about the resale value there, but it was silver like back in Egypt. And then there was the Greeks and the Italians, the Yugoslavians, the Chinese, the Thai, the Cambodian family. The whole, we were surrounded by all of these cultures. But every single one of them had a hope for a better future. And they were working hard. They had a vision. Because they had a hope and a vision and an expectation, they had energy and they were working hard. Everybody was working hard. But you know what? As a little kid, you don't really think much, but you feel a lot. And if I go back and took my back, myself back in time, the force and the current that I felt most powerfully in Melbourne was the force coming from the Italian community. 
the Italian community in Melbourne was like, they were on their own trip, man. They were like a current flowing that was almost as strong as the rest of Melbourne. They contributed in terms of momentum and economy and personality and in so many ways uh, into the whole city and even to this day continuously. And it's, it's amazing when you look back, uh, when I look back and try to analyse what I felt. Uh, every Italian was going somewhere, doing somewhere that they were or up early, they were working, they were going somewhere, the, the creativity, the industrialness, the work ethic, but the celebration as well, man. They were all getting together, partying and celebrating, and, and, and it's, it's almost like they carried and passed on energy through their hope. I would say that the Italian community was uh, an incredible example of a very hope-filled culture. And so um, we'll go to the, the next slide. When I was able to think back a few years ago and put words to what I felt with the Italian community, the first word that I wrote, I went away with the Lord and I said, God, what, what was it that was so hopeful and powerful about what I, saw, what I felt? The first word I wrote was vision. And it's amazing. And what we saw about the Italian community is they, they hated to work for anybody else. They always wanted to have their own business uh, because it was their dream. It was their personal thing. And there's a lot of benefits to that because uh, they could multiply it as well. And so they could pass it on to their children. And so it was amazing that it seemed like every single Italian I met had a vision. Uh, and it was being passed on to the next generation. This is the powerful thing. You know, a lot of us young boys are playing cricket and football or whatever it is. And the Italian boys are ready to build their first block of units. You know, they're given a trowel when they're born, a concrete trowel when they're one, and when they're two, they get their first cement mix. By the time they're three, they poured their first concrete driveway. Uh, and they didn't just do concrete. I'm, you know, you Italians, you can handle this if you're here today. You know, but they did tend to work in the area of food, restaurants, uh, farming, concrete, construction. They knew what they were doing. They passed it on, and there was an incredible sense of momentum that came out of this because... Every young boy had a vision. Every Italian had a vision. They were busy. You could see the, the energy that was flowing from them. And the second thing I noticed about the Italian community when I wrote down was they achieved. They, they worked to achieve. They didn't work to the clock. And it's easier to do that when it's your business, isn't it? It's easier to get seduced into working for someone else. I'm just going to work until five and whatever. You know, um, and that's, a, that's an, an, an integrity issue we all have to face. But because it was their own business, they were going to finish. They were going to win. They were going to break through. And they learned perseverance. They le learned tenacity. They learned uh, to fight through. And they did it together. They were like a swarm that would come in. Great aunt Sophie would come along with her trail and uncles and aunts and cousins and nephews, they would all come and they would swarm over a project and they would push and push and push and that was going to be done today no matter what. And there was something exciting about winning, isn't it? It, it developed a culture in them of winning and there's something so wonderful about winning and being able to close something, tick it off and finish. And I, I noticed that about them. But the other thing I noticed about them was not only did they all work together, but at the end of that day, everybody was going to celebrate. So as soon as that last stroke of the trail happened on Mario's driveway, and this is a funny thing, is the whole family helped Mario. Well, Mel Mario was, was committed for the next six months because every weekend there was another relative's driveway they were all going to have to show up to. That's how it works. You're in and you're constantly in. The food would come out, and abundance, and the wine, and the piano accordion, and the music, and the dancing, and the singing, and great-grandma's dancing with great-grandson, and it was just, you know, as an outsider, you would walk past this, and it was like, whoa, it was a beautiful thing. But I realized, uh, looking back, that there's something powerful about celebration that many of us don't get. And so what would happen is celebration, when you really celebrate love and joy and victory together, it releases endorphins. And endorphins are wonderful markers 
And I reckon they would have reinforced how wonderful family was. They would have reinforced their relationship with work. Their relationship with work would have been positive because there would have been wonderful feelings associated with work. Uh, and then th they wouldn't be afraid of hard work. Hard work is wonderful because you get to win and you get to celebrate and you get this endorphin rush. And so you could see the brilliance of this cycle and how it just perpetuated each other. The other thing they would do is late into the night, the older Italians, once they'd had a bit more wine, would start telling their stories. And of course, the stories, the Italians of old would be bigger and stronger and they could carry 35 bags of potatoes in one hand and, you know, and they get bigger and stronger and more amazing. And, you know, what was happening is the younger generation has been a part of the vision and the hope of the older generation. And now through those stories and celebrating and working together, it's imparted into the next generation. And so the next generation of Italians is sitting there, of little kids and teenagers are sitting there thinking, this is awesome. I have hope too. I, I can do that. I want a vision too. And so you can see how this dynamic, this cycle of hope. And again, uh, those of you probably laughing because there's a lot of bad stuff there as well and problems. It wasn't all beautiful. But I'm talking about the big picture observation of there's no doubt there was this incredible momentum and hope that was being passed on to that I'm getting at here. Um, and so the next generation uh, is just sitting there thinking, I can't wait to do this myself. I can be like Mario. I can be like Giuseppe. I can be like Luigi. These are legends, man. I want to do that too. And I think we're sitting here thinking, oh God, we want that for our younger generation. We, we so want that for our grandsons and our granddaughters. How can we give them that hope? Like that, that bag of... Uh, saline solution that would just give them that the hope and the joy to be able to be excited about the future that is out there for them. And there is. And we just want to scream at our grandkids and tell them that. But of course, it's not our words. It's, it's, a, it's a force that we need to pass on to them so that they can walk into that future that we want so much for them. You know, um, as I describe with my parents, there's a test of hope. There's a threshold. Hope has got to go through a threshold to get into the future. And so that next generation of Italians, their hope is always tested by their circumstances. So after the party and all the joy and the hope rush of the future, I want to be like Luigi. Well, the questions that are going to be asked the next day. And the circumstances that, you know, little Dino is going to face are different to what Luigi faced, but they still had circumstances they had to face. The circumstances are not, what, not wrong or right. There's data they needed to draw from, and that data doesn't necessarily stop hope. It just needs to be analysed and decisions need to be made. But it is a test here. And sometimes hope doesn't go beyond the circumstances. It shrivels up and withers and dies because of the circumstances are so intimidating to uh, that young, hopeful person. Now, part of the problem... Well, well let's, let's play this out, for example. So let's look at the early 70s. Some of you guys might remember. Um, looking at you, I'm making an assumption, some of you. <laughs> uh, let's look at the early 70s. They would have woken up full of hope, and the first test is... This is the recession we have to have. Interest rates are now 17%. And Mikhail Gorbachev has just bought 10 new nuclear rockets. And that war in uh, Vietnam is getting really concerning. And that band Pink Floyd, they're telling our children they don't need an education. Oh, my gosh. And the microwave is going to destroy our families. We're not eating together anymore. The microwave is the most evil invention. Of, you know, so I think you know what I'm talking about. But... Back in that day, those circumstances would have been real. They would have been intense. They would have really been sobering and they would have tested our hope. Now, the approach to that is to look at them and work out how hope can get around that and work with that. And I know many people that invested with 17% interest and bought houses and went ahead and did that. The problem is that when you were looking at your circumstances... The, the Bible tells us there are things, these demonic spirits called false prophets. And these false prophets are demonic spirits that operate through fear and take a circumstance 
and make you look at it through fear. And when you spin that around in a cycle of fear, it turns out is a lie. And the whole goal of lies is to undermine confidence. When confidence is undermined by a lie or by fear through a false prophet, and the false prophet could be family, it could be the media, it could be social media, it could be anything. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you know, exponent, you know, what are the words we're using? Catastrophic. Catastrophic, everything's catastrophic. You know, the, the, the false prophets are there, aren't they? It could be anybody uh, trying to interpret your circumstances through fear, and God calls that the false prophet. And we have a responsibility to identify the false prophet and silence the false prophet of lies, because if we listen to the false prophet, what will happen, he undermines confidence. When there's no confidence, there cannot be any faith. When there's no faith, there cannot be any hope. The devil wants to rob us of hope. The way that he robs hope is that he robs confidence. The way that he robs confidence is by interpreting circumstances through fear and lies. So confidence is the beginning so that we can have hope. And so the goal of the devil is to undermine confidence through lying to us, through fear about our circumstances. No doubt our circumstances are very real and need consideration. And so um, let me continue on here. Uh, so I... Um, I love the, the story in the Bible of Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29 is a really interesting story, and it's similar to uh, the migrants in Australia. The only difference is that the Israelis were taken as captives into Babylon. So they were a captive nation. But what was really interesting, it wasn't like they were locked up in a prison. They were actually a nation thriving in their own culture within another nation very much like the Italians that I saw back in Melbourne. And what was really happening is the Babylonians were really smart. The Babylonians saw and they recognized this culture of hope in the Israelis and they said, man, when we let them plant vineyards and grow and do their culture and celebrate and work and do things the way they are, they are, blessed. They are building Babylon. And so Babylon was really smart and they let them be a nation and a culture and to do, have their culture, their whole culture of hope. And what was happening is all of the skills of the Israelis were building Babylon and Babylon was prospering amazingly. So it was a very smart uh, arrangement that Babylon had. But what had happened is the Israelis, again, they had this cycle of hope, a little bit like the Italians. They were celebrating, they were working together, they were prospering, they were building their own houses and, and benefiting economically as well as the, the benefit to Babylon. And it seems like they got to the place where New Hope and New Vision said, now is the time. Now is the time to get, to, we, we've got enough momentum, we've got enough skills, let's go back to Jerusalem and rebuild Jerusalem and have our own nation again. And here's the bad news. It wasn't bad news, actually. It was, it was just that the circumstances were not right at that time. And so God wrote them a letter. And he starts off in this letter. He starts the letter by saying, I am the Lord God Almighty. I am the God of Israel. What God was trying to say is, don't panic. Confident, be confident. The hope in the future is still there. Absolutely. We just have, we're working with the circumstances. I'm telling you it's not the right time. Don't freak out. Don't be afraid. I'm the rock. Trust me. The vision's going to happen. It's just going to be delayed by 70 years. In the meantime, what did God do? He said, keep doing what you're doing. He said, build houses, settle down, invest, get married, have children, Get them to be married and, and just and eat your crops. And God was, was basically pointing to the vision. What you're doing, your culture of hope, this culture of hope, of dreaming, uh, of being excited, of working together, of celebrating, it's powerful. Just keep doing it and you're going to grow and, and you're going to be blessed. And in time, uh, with right, in the right circumstances, it will happen. And so God was speaking into this situation. And, and so... Um, he then on went on and he spoke, into, uh, he spoke into hope and he said, I'm reminding you, I have a hope and a future for you. He just said, in 70 years it will happen, just not right now. 
Uh, and then he spoke in and he said this. He said, don't listen to the false prophets. Let's go back to the, the Italian community. One of the things that probably would have happened once they were intimidated by the circumstances of the 17% interest and all those things, they would have probably had false prophets speaking into the younger generation saying, maybe we should go back to Italy. These Australians hate us anyway. They call us horrible names and we call them skippies, you know, whatever. But, you know, it's, it's just not working. Let's go back. It's better back there. Or the other thing that the false prophets would have said to the Italian community is, hey, can't you see how much Melbourne's benefiting from us? Let's just cross our arms and do the hypothermia thing. Let's pull back. Let's pull back. And, and hang on a minute. Let, let's stop this whole extended family thing sucking off us too. Let's pull back to my family and then let's just keep, you know, the false prophets would have been saying that. Well, it's interesting that God spoke into that to the Israelis. He anticipated what the false prophets would be saying to the Jews. And he said to them, don't try to go back to Jerusalem yourself. Stay here. Trust me. Because he knew that they were getting together thinking, let's just go and make it happen anyway. He said, if you do that, you will die, you will be vulnerable, you will, be, you will not survive. The other thing he spoke into, he said, don't pull back from Babylon. You know the story. He says, bless Babylon. He, he's, he's, talking, he's talking the saline solution here. <laughs> he's not talking about hypothermia or uh, he's speaking against it. He said, if, if you withdraw from Babylon, then you'll suffer. It's a little bit like our economy. We, we've got this issue. We talk about recession. Uh, when everybody is investing and investing, it keeps the whole thing moving, and then the individuals will be blessed. But when every individual pulls back, the whole machine stops, and then everybody becomes poorer. And so it's a little bit like that. And God is saying, you know, if, you, if Babylon starts to hurt, you're going to start to hurt. They're going to start to shut you down. They're going to start to bring out the whips. They're going to take away your privileges. They're going to drive you like slaves. So God said, bless the Babylonians, invest in them, and when they prosper. So he's talking about saline solution. You know, be excited. Love blessing them. You know, use your crafts and invest in the city around you. And as you do that, it's all going to continue to go well, and then I'm going to come back, and you'll take all of your riches with you into your hope and future. I think that is an incredible story that was so much like what I saw in Melbourne, but I think very much like what we're facing here in Lismore. Let's now look at Lismore 2022. Let's have a look at the circumstances. Well, well let's even go back before then. How are the hopes and the dreams going from before the floods and before the pandemic and Let's, let's look at the circumstances that some of you are facing as Lismoreites, but also as Australians and as citizens of the world. China, oh my gosh, the China thing, you know, just brooding around us. Okay, you talk about Mikhail, Mikhail Gorbachev back in the 70s, the China thing. We've got, you know, we've got the COVID thing, we've got the supply chain thing, we've got the pandemic thing, we've got the floods. These are so real, so traumatic. These are circumstances that... What is happening is hope is being dried up like hypothermia. And our job as Christians is to not allow our hope to be stolen. We need to maintain confidence and operate in vision and keep that cycle of hope going as Christians so that we can flow out and be a blessing in Lismore so that therefore we can be blessed as well. And so there is a great challenge here. And as Christians, we are so key for this moment. Part of the vulnerability that non-Christians have is they place their confidence in their skill. They place their confidence in their health. They place their confidence in the economy. They place their confidence in their family. And when the microwave destroys the family, then you can't have confidence in your family. Um, and I think you know what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, when you think about the non-Christian, it's a shifting, insecure thing, trying to find confidence everywhere. So when every confidence around us is being ripped away, you can understand why non-Christians' confidence would be shaken. You can understand, therefore, why they wouldn't have faith and, therefore, why hope is being lost. The Christian is so different in this situation because our confidence is in God 
And he helps us interpret the, interpret the circumstances through his promise to give us a hope and a future. And it's just a process, and I'm not being flippant here. I understand the trauma and the real devastation. But it doesn't change the, the place that God is a rock. He is faithful. He's promised to give a hope and a future. There is a big detour here. Maybe it's 70 years. I hope not. Maybe it's seven years. But there may be a detour but he is still faithful to do what he said he will do. We just have to work with the circumstances, but not allow the false prophets to interpret the circumstances to dictate to us. And so um, I want to just, um, I, I don't know how long I've taken, I'm going to rush through this, and I'm going to explain to you why the Christians are so powerful now. And I, I want to talk about how we can be, you already have an amazing culture of hope, but I think culture is a little bit like a whirlpool, and the faster and faster you work at the current of power can get better and stronger. So you can be a little, like a little Italian culture here that can flow, and, and if you get it right and do everything together and learn some of these lessons of how to develop a powerful culture, you can overflow and be a powerful force in the city of Lismore as a part of this rebuild process. But God is saying to you, don't head for the hills and run away. You know what? Um, I love Maury, and if God called me to go to Maury, I would. But it's not appropriate to run away to Norway, nor, uh, to Maury. And there's a lot of Christians I know, men in my age, that are saying, let's get away from the government, let's run and hide. You know, running and reacting is never going to work out well. Uh, if God calls you to another place, that is wonderful because he's called you into a hope and a future. But running out in the bush and hiding from the government is not necessarily going to work out well. And secondly, crossing our arms to the pain and suffering of Lismore and pulling back, even though it is very overwhelming, is not going to be the answer either because we withdraw and withdraw and then we lose hope too and we're of no use. Let me give you a biblical basis for why we as Christians have hope. The first reason is that God is a rock. You know, God is so amazing, and out of all the metaphors, the ways that he could describe himself, he uses a rock. <laughs> you say, God, tell us who you are. And he says, I'm a rock. I'm like, really? Can you do better than that, God? Uh, you can, you, you've, got, you've got the stage. You can go on and on. No, I'm a rock. <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, why does God call him a rock? In the floods of Lismore, isn't water amazing? It is so powerful. It gets into everything. It tears everything up. It's like chaos. But you know, the only thing that's unchanged out there is that rock. It's almost like the rock sitting there smoking a cigar, chewing gum, chilled, totally unintimidated about the flood. Nothing impacted and nothing changed. And I think that's what God's trying to get across to us. He's unintimidated by circumstances. He is unaffected. His plans are not changed. He does what he wants something incredibly securing about that, that when we stand on that rock, he is unshakable. He does not react to circumstances. He is unfazed. And that's why he says, I'm a rock. And one of the most powerful metaphors in the Bible is when God says, well, I'm not only a rock, but see this fountain of water coming out of me. There's desert around and you don't understand it, but this fountain of water, is, this stream is pouring out of a rock. And God says, that's it. Hope is the fountain. It comes from the confidence. Confidence and hope flows out of confidence. And that is the powerful metaphor. The second reason we have hope in God as Christians is that he's our father. I'm not sure if, um, you know, kids or even wives have um, kind of worked this out, but sometimes us men, uh, it looks like we're more interested in the kid's future. And, and, and it looks like we're not loving him in the moment. We do. But there's something about a father that wants to love a child into a hope and a future. And it's a, it's a confusing thing uh, because, you know, I think, uh, see, I, I get in trouble when I generalize, but I've observed women are, are often better at loving in the moment. And a father says, I love you, but I'm so, I so want you to have a good future. I so want you to make the right decision. I so want you to be blessed. And there's this misunderstanding there. It's not that we don't love any different, but there's something about a father that's not only personal. So God is your father. 
So he loves you and he desires and he wa- he, he's straining and every part of him wants you to have a hope and a future. So God is your father and his whole motivation is for you to be blessed and to have a hope and a future. The second thing is that when you ask God to put some words to describe him, he says, good. Sounds like a teenager, doesn't it? How are you doing? Good. Well, God's a little bit the same, but very different. He says, oh, describe yourself, God. I'm good. I'm good. When you think about it, it's a pretty emphatic statement. I am good. I'm not only your father with hope and a future, but I am, it's a good future. I want to give you goodness. That's my whole motivation. I want to give my goodness to you. I want to bless you. The next thing I want to say from a, this is a fast biblical basis for, for hope. The second thing is there's a Hebrew word when God describes himself, and it, and, and it says pequod. And it, it paints the picture almost like uh, you could probably sort of see it as a womb, the wall of a womb, uh, where God is hovering over you. Probably a better way of seeing it is that you're walking along a timeline, and he is over the top of you all the time, never leaving you. He is hovering over you. But the word pictures in Hebrew por- portray a God that is anticipating over you, waiting, waiting for you in faith to invite him to intervene and help direct your path and to bless you. He's waiting constantly uh, over you, Christian, as you're walking, waiting for you to call out to him in faith and so that he can bless you. That's his heart, his whole motivation. The final thing I want to say is that when I think about the fact that God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, they all were funnier than Alan. They were all smarter than Jackie. They had everything. They needed nothing. They had absolute contentment together. And you've got, probably gone through this process. You ask the question, why did they create human beings? The only conclusion that I can come to is that they are so utterly, completely motivated with generosity that they created human beings so that they can give everything they have away. They want to, their whole motivation is to create you so that you can rule and reign with them and be a part. And, you know, if they were selfish like us, they would want to keep that to themselves. But they are at the extreme opposite. They, their whole motivation of God is to give everything that they have to us. You know, you think about that theologically, you might not agree. But I work with that. And when I go into my prayer room or my auditorium in YWAM, I go to the right-hand corner and I look up and I go through this process and I start with the, the presupposition and I say, God, the circumstances like David... God, the circumstances are swarming all around me. But I look up, and the first thing I do is I see God at the top of a ladder, and I see thousands of angels carrying goodness, with, sent by God to deliver goodness down to people through that ladder. And I use this visual process I go through based on the supposition that I believe that his desire is to bless me. So I approach him, and I look, and I look, and I see him looking at me, and I, and I hear him saying, what do you want, Dave? Wow, what, a, what an incredible position and a biblical basis for expectancy and hope. We've got that as Christians. And I just want to f- just conclude by saying, if we can get hold of that, and we can be together a culture, and learn even from the Italians and the, 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 the Israelis, because they did similarly. They're the other culture that does this, that's incre- like a force. If we can get hold of that in the church, man, hope will just float. You've heard that before. <laughs> hope will float out of these doors. There will be a synergy. Uh, you know, synergy is a wonderful thing because it's like, oh man, it's, I'm doing this, but it's effortless. Uh, just all of these wonderful things would come together and we would feel like we have money to give and energy to give and emotions to give and life to share together. I think what happens is, and I think you'd probably say this, that hope is probably worked, sorry, hopelessness has probably worked its effect on us and people are withdrawing. I, I need to protect myself, I need to keep my money, I need to keep my emotions, I need to keep my time, I need to keep my 
energy because this subconscious thing is hypothermia. I need to stay alive. That's what fear does. And God says, don't be afraid. I'm your rock. You have a hope and a future. Trust me. And I think let's move in the opposite. Let's share and see that culture of hope created here. So um, there's a few thoughts, a few pictures, a few metaphors. A few, few, I hope it stimulates some encouragement. Most of all, I hope that you have more hope today. Bless you guys.